get involved in different projects that they're working on. Okay, so um, the pictures up here are the research faculty that are not speaking today, just so you know that uh, their faces and just a general blurb about their research interests, okay? So, and you'll get to meet the other professors today. Okay, I'm not gonna go through that because you can read it. And these are, if you're ever in Carson Taylor Hall, this information is on that big screen is rotating through the different faculty. So you can see that. Okay. Is it gonna go? Click the PowerPoint. Click the PowerPoint. Oh. Mouse. Okay. All right. So ways that you can get involved in research in the School of Biological Sciences. First is to contact faculty members whose research interests you. Um, and you can find out what uh, faculty do um, by, I'm not gonna have you memorize this link. If you wanna get to it, you can just uh, Google LaTeX Biological Sciences faculty or BISC faculty, and you can get to this. It's hard to look, uh, navigate. Um, on text website. So if you get to that link, you can come here and you see there's a list of the different faculty. Now I'm gonna pick on Dr. Clay because she's up here first. Um, and if you click on her, you'll see down here that there's uh, a website for her. And so you can go here and you can read more about her research. And a, different, uh, a lot of the research faculty have their own research pages and you can find it that way. So that's how you can find what research different faculty are doing. Okay. Um, so contact them, talk to them. We like talking about what we do. We, we're spending our lives doing it. So don't worry about feeling shy or that you're gonna be bugging a professor if you contact them. We like it, we want you to do it, <laughs> okay? Um, and one of the things you can do is just volunteer your time. Um, so different professors may have different views on this on whether you can just come in and volunteer, um, but I let folks in my lab come and just watch what other people are doing to see if they like it. Um, but often before they select a particular project that they're gonna work on. Another way is you can do it for course credit. So the courses that are BIS 240 and BIS 360 uh, is where you can do independent research with a faculty member for course credit. Most folks take BIS 360 because if you're a biology major, you have to have a certain number above 300 electives. This counts as that. And combined in BIS 240, 360, and 361, you can get up to five hours of credit counted towards your degree. You can also do an honors thesis. If you're in the honors program, um, you can do this honors 499. You're gonna need to talk with your research mentor. This is not something you can just walk in and do in one quarter. Um, this is, you've been working on a project for a while, and then you can get honors credit for it by writing an honors thesis. We also have what's called the concurrent enrollment program. And let me get out of here and show you that. Um, so again, you can just Google LaTeX BISC concurrent enrollment and get to this site. So I'm escaping and going here. So this is a concurrent enrollment program. So you can read through this. Um, basically what this is, is if you are a senior within 30 hours of graduating, you can enroll in the concurrent program. And what this allows you to do is to take undergraduate courses and graduate courses at the same time. The graduate courses will do double duty. They'll count for your undergraduate degree and they'll also count for your graduate degree. So if you get into this concurrent enrollment program, um, so here's the who can apply information and things like that. But if you get into this, then generally 
you only take an extra year to get a master's degree. Typically, it can take two years to get a master's degree. So you can get a lot of your coursework done and some of your research done while still an undergraduate. And your tops would pay for those graduate courses um, while you're still an undergrad. So that's another way that you can uh, get involved and earn credit. Um, and then finally, I've got down here um, is internships. So we have two courses, which is BIS 478 and Environmental Science 478. Um, so this is, these are not typically done with a, a biology faculty member. Um, this is something you would find at another institution and do research. A lot of folks do this, uh, these things in summer, uh, if they get a summer job. Who was it that was in my class this morning that was telling me that she did an internship that was, that was wrangling uh, diamondback rattlers over the summer? So, um, so if you get a summer job doing something like that, you could get course credit for it, enrolling in these programs. Okay. All right. Any questions about, I kind of ran through that real fast because we've got a number of faculty to talk to you. Questions about anything that I've covered so far? Okay. I also want to point out that like I work with birds and if you're somebody that wants to go to med school, you might be thinking, why would I want to work with anybody that works with birds? I'm going to med school. All of the students working in my lab right now plan to go to med school, right? So there's a number of reasons to do that. One is it might be fun and interesting and you'll learn something, right? So we had a, uh, an alum come to visit with us and he'd been a practicing physician for you know, a couple of decades. And he said that one of his most outstanding and memorable experiences at tech was when he took a mammalogy class with a professor that since retired and he got to go out to West Texas and catch rodents. And that's what stuck in his head. So, and he went to med school and a practicing physician for many years. Um, so, and you'll also learn some valuable skills that can apply to help you think, you know, scientifically, how do you address a research question? What's a proper way to go about answering it? So you can get that kind of experience and it can help you um, when you're moving on to the next step. And often, whether you get, um, you know, have a successful interview for a job or med school or whatever professional school is the connections you make, right? Something that makes you stick out from all the other applicants. And somebody might say, oh, I see here, you worked with birds. Can you tell me about that? I got an email this morning from a former student who's applying to PA school. And he said, I just wanna let you know, I put you down as my mentor for that woodpecker project we worked on. So somebody might be contacting you. And I'm like, that's great, it's really awesome. So don't think that because someone's research is not directly applicable to human health, that it can't help you advance in whatever career you end up doing, okay? Yes. Oh, yes, and I've even. Okay, all right. There are are there any in there? Okay. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Well, if there aren't questions, we're just going to hop into uh, the different faculty, and I'm going to go first since I'm standing up here already. So, um, my lab is the Manus Organismal Biology Lab or Mobile Lab. And what we're interested in is how organisms survive and reproduce in their natural environments. So how we go about answering those types of questions is integrated, right? So we use behavioral ecology, conservation, demography, toxicology, endocrinology, immunology, a lot of um, sort of physiology type things. Um, in my current research group, I've got two graduate students and nine undergraduate students. 
So I'm going to tell you a bit about a couple of different projects that I have going on. I have students working on all of them right now, but we can always use extra hands. Okay, so one is looking at metal contaminants and waterfowl tissue. Um, so these are, we're looking for mercury and lead. These are heavy metals that can cause um, adverse effects in these in organisms. Mercury is a particular problem in Louisiana. Our waterways are uh, have a lot of mercury in them, some of them. And you'll, if you ever go out, you might see signs that tell you how many fish you can eat from a particular body of water each month or whether you should eat them at all, right? And lead is a problem in some places because of lead shot. Um, people used to hunt with that and lead fishing lures. So um, this figure just shows you that these, these uh, metals, this one's mercury that's in here, that it can amplify up the food chain. Right, so we have the fish here that we have um, guidance for on whether we can eat them or not as humans, but birds eat the fish. And if it's a duck, hunters eat those ducks. So ducks are even higher up on the food, some of them even higher on the food chain than these fish. And there are actually some states that have started putting out advisories for how many ducks you can eat from a, a particular body of water. So on this project, what we do is we do, do dissection. We mostly look for um, these metals in the liver. So dissect the ducks to get out the liver. Uh, we then freeze dry it using a lyophilizer that's in chemistry. Uh, we then do tissue homogenation and then x-ray fluorescence, which is another uh, piece of equipment that's in chemistry. So I'll collaborate with folks in chemistry to get this done. Um, and the x-ray fluorescence is what actually measures the metal. And then data analysis when you're done. Um, and I also have some folks that are looking at stomach and gut contents. So they're particularly looking for lead shot and measurements of, of lead in the liver and to see if that corresponds with the number of parasites that we might find in their, in their digestive system. With the idea that if an animal is dealing with a contaminant, they're, they don't have the energy left over to deal with the parasites, okay? So that's one project. Another project is looking at stress, aging, and hematology. So this is a project where I've got some blood samples that I, I collected from these birds you see here. These are Nazca boobies uh, that live in the Galapagos Islands. So I got blood samples from them and I measured stress, uh, stress hormone levels in it. So if you've had animal physiology with me or endocrinology with Dr. Nesterova, you've, you know that when you're stressed, you have high circulating stress hormone. That interacts with the immune system. So it, it actually changes the, the number of cells you have in circulation, right? So what I have students working on is that I have blood smears that I made with these blood samples too on microscope slides. Um, so um, my student is staining these and looking at them through a microscope and identifying different kinds of white blood cells. And he's doing differential counts because if an animal is stressed, you see elevated numbers of heterophils relative to lymphocytes. Lymphocytes are what are uh, involved in a, a, an immune memory response, which is why we get vaccines, right? So those number of cells are depressed if you're stressed. So we look at this and try to see if it corresponds with the uh, stress hormone and also with the age of the individual. I know the ages of these birds, these birds can live into the mid thirties. Um, and they also, uh, reproduction is a stressful um, event. So I know how much they've reproduced and what they were currently doing when the blood sample was collected. And finally, effectiveness of restoration at Wafer Creek Ranch. Wafer Creek Ranch is a shortly pine oak hickory ecosystem. This ecosystem was essentially uh, removed from Louisiana. Um, it's only small remnant ecosystems left. Uh, we have an alum who's also a long time practicing 
physician um, who owns this property and he's been working on restoring it for the past uh, 10 years or so. So the methods that he's been using has been controlled burns, um, herbicide application to um, off-site vegetation. And then there's some sites there where he hasn't really done anything, hasn't done any uh, restoration. So what we wanna do there is to compare the forest habitat structure in the birds in areas with different management regimes. So um, these, the different levels of restoration activities cost different amounts of money. So if you can get to what you want out of a forest um, more cheaply, then that'd be great. So it depends on what your end use for the forest will be, but uh, the owner of this property wants to get it back to its original function to help preserve biodiversity. So this is a map of the area. Um, let me see if I can get up here. So this is Louisiana Tech down here. Up here is where Wafer Creek Ranch is. Um, it's like a 15 minute drive from campus, which is really nice. So he's got different areas. This is where he's burned in herbicide. This is just burned. And then we have some control sites where he hasn't done anything. So we want to basically catch birds there and see uh, the, the avian biodiversity between these different types of management regimes. And so in this, um, my students that have worked on this project uh, have learned mist netting. So there's the net right there. Uh, you can't really see it and you're not supposed to because the birds fly into it and get caught. Um, and so you learn mist netting and handling birds. Uh, so we ban them and measure them and then let them go. Um, so, but we do have to do a good bit of walking for this. So if you wanna work on this, you need, should be able to walk about seven miles over uneven terrain. But there are things you can do, even if you can't do that, like help us with data collection um, where we're processing birds. And we catch a lot of really pretty birds. So, and that's my contact information if you have questions. And that's all I have. And I think Dr. Clay is next. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Dr. Clay. Many of you have met me as someone who helps teach this course, but now I'll kind of introduce myself a little bit more as a researcher and what I do here in biology. So in my research, I take a little bit of a biochemist sort of point of view of the world. So there are about 25 of the elements on the periodic table that are actually required for organisms to survive and reproduce. And when those elements, you don't get enough of them or you get too much of them, this impacts organismal behavior, their ability to survive, reproduce, and what they're actually doing. So a lot of what my lab asks at many different levels is when nutrients are too much or too little, what happens? So for example, sodium is one of the main focuses in my lab. So salt is something we probably don't think too much about because we get it in our food all the time. But for a lot of organisms, sodium is actually really hard to come by. So if you've ever craved something salty, you kind of know what that's like, a good bag of potato chips or something. So this alters organismal activity and it can have big effects. So here is an example from up in inland Canada, where if you're reading these signs, it says, don't let moose lick your car. So the moose here are so starved for sodium that they learned that the salt from the roads to get rid of the ice sticks on cars. And they're literally going up to cars and licking it. So I don't work with moose, but this is a pretty cool example of what being out of balance with one of these nutrients can do. And we also see this at other organisms. So with bees uh, right here, these are stingless bees. This is my sweaty friend. He was hiking. You can see they're here lapping up the salt. This is his sweaty backpack, which they have also readily landed on and are licking up the salt from the backpack there. And so when you're thinking about it, we can see some big changes in behavior. This probably has some effect at what they're doing in the environment. 
So one of those organisms that has big effects on ecosystems are termites. So this is wood, hardwood and softwood that we've added a little bit of salt, really low level stuff that would occur naturally in coastal environments where ocean spray kind of washes up. Organisms usually have enough salt if they live near the coast. But inland, you add a little bit of salt to wood and basically this is what happens. The termites just destroy that. So if you can imagine a forest then where you're adding or depriving it of salt, this is gonna change the rate at which wood breaks down, nutrients move through that system. And if you're interested in humans and stuff, maybe how much termites are getting onto your house. So that's one example. My lab does a lot of different projects. We do field work, which includes both observational and experimental studies. We'll test hypotheses. Some of the areas we test hypotheses in include decomposition and decomposers. So those organisms that are breaking down that dead organic matter, things that live in the leaf litter and soil there. We work on ants, restoration projects like Dr. Manus talked about out at Wafer Creek Ranch. Um, we look at pollinators, nutrients, and what that does to the system. And you get skills like learning how to design an experiment effectively how to sample soil, how to sample a wide variety of invertebrates. This is chance collecting pollinators using pan traps. This is an ant sampling method here, a broad leaf litter uh, invertebrate sampling. Um, so a lot of different types of sampling in the lab. Additionally, we do lab stuff. So if you're not interested in going out into the field, or even if you are doing a little bit of both, We'll test and run experiments in things like greenhouse or music housing experiments in the lab, or just process some of the samples that we've gone out and collected. So working on microscopes, getting skills in microscopy and fine manipulation of organisms underneath the scope. Additionally, learning how to identify some of these organisms there um, and data management, data analysis and experimental design are some of the additional skills students in my lab walk away with. At the end of this, one of the things I think is really cool is we present our research. We do this both orally and we do this both in written form. So students will present their research at local, regional and national meetings where a wide variety of scientists will get to hear about the things that they're doing in the lab, which is a really cool experience and both in again, written and oral form there. And we've also published research. So this is a paper that just came out from Connor Grunz's, who's now graduated undergraduate research. And this is an honors thesis by Maggie Herman. So we try to get that information out there, uh, which is the last and most important part of the scientific method. So if you're interested in doing any of those things or want to find out more about what's going on in the lab, please don't hesitate to contact me. If you have a resume, great, include that. If not, still feel free to contact me um, and put a little bit about what interests you. So with that, I will hand it over to the next person who's talking. Hello, everybody. Um, I am Dr. Julia Earle. Um, I've had a few of you in class. Um, my lab works on a lot of different things. You may have seen all the frogs on my door. Um, so that's one of the things I do. But right now, my work is really focused on aquatic terrestrial linkages. Maybe. Oh, is it this yeah, one? Sorry. There's two up here yeah. trying to confuse me. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so what are aquatic terrestrial linkages? They're basically connections between aquatic and terrestrial ecosystems. And for the most part, I study, let's see, um, I study how leaf litter that falls off of trees, which is about to happen here soon, um, into ponds affects different ecosystem processes and water quality. And then how those ponds contribute amphibians and aquatic insects back into terrestrial ecosystems. So we know that leaves are super important for aquatic ecosystems. Um, they're broken down by both microbes and also 
um, by different aquatic invertebrates. And those leaves provide nutrients and energy um, for all those organisms and really influence how the ecosystem works um, in these different aquatic systems. Interestingly, the species of leaves is actually really important to what happens in those systems. So these are three different examples. Um, in this ecosystem, there's a mix of deciduous trees and their leaves are really good for aquatic invertebrates. So they produce lots and those support the production of lots of fish in those streams and lots of emergence of aquatic invertebrates that feed things like birds and bats and spiders. And the microbes help a little bit and they produce some carbon dioxide. If you get forests around streams that are mixed cottonwoods, it's more of a balance between microbes and aquatic invertebrates. And so there's kind of an intermediate amount of fish supported by those aquatic invertebrates, intermediate output of aquatic invertebrates and more carbon dioxide. In this type of forest as tamarisk, those are really not very good for aquatic invertebrates. There's very, very few of them. And most of the decomposition of those leaves comes from microbes. And so there's not very many fish. There's not a lot of invertebrates leaving the stream to support terrestrial consumers, but there's a whole lot of carbon dioxide produced by those microbes. And so you can see that really influenced the carbon cycle if we alter what kinds of trees are around these streams. So in my lab, we've been working on how different species of leaves impact the behavior of organisms. So do different organisms choose their environment based on the leaves that are in those environments? So we did an experiment where we put baby pools out and we put different kinds of tree leaves in those pools. And we let these frogs, Pope's gray tree frogs, decide which pools to lay their eggs in. And so we can see here on the y-axis, we have the number of eggs laid and they really liked post oak leaves. Um, that was the thing they preferred a lot. We also collected the beetles that colonized those pools. And this is Lacophilus fasciatus, which doesn't have a common name, so I can't give you a better term for it. And it liked different kinds of leaves. So it preferred these three, black willow, Bradford pear, and loblolly pine. So different organisms are making different choices um, when they're selecting these different ecosystems. A big open question is, what about the diversity of these leaves? Most of the time, if you go to a pond or a stream, there's not one species of trees around it. So does the diversity of trees around these ponds and streams matter for those aquatic communities and ecosystems? We're also interested in, does how we look at diversity matter? So we could think about the diversity of species, which is probably what you thought of first and what we've been talking about. Um, but you can also think about the diversity of chemistry in those leaves or the diversity of evolutionary lineages of those trees. So different species of trees have different evolutionary histories. And maybe if you have some from a mix, that's more important than just the number of species. So I have a relatively new grant to kind of look at these questions. And so we're gonna look at how um, the diversity of leaves in these aquatic ecosystems affects colonizer diversity and ecosystem function. So this diagram kind of gets at it. We have one um, pond that has um, higher diversity of leaves in it and one that has a lower diversity of leaves. And the hypothesis is that we'll get more diverse insect colonizers with more diverse leaves and less diverse insect colonizers with less diverse leaves. And then we're gonna also look at how colonizer diversity and leaf diversity affect ecosystem function, like how fast those leaves decompose. And again, we're interested in diversity of different types. So we're gonna be doing some different experiments with that in my lab over the next three years. Um, these are the um, pools that we created um, and we're gonna be putting the different mixtures of leaves in these and looking at what insects colonize them. We also do some field work um, and we sort through leaves and look for invertebrates and identify them in the lab. Um, we look at how different species of leaves um, alter water chemistry. And so that'll be part of this as well. Um, and then we also do water chemistry itself. So this is measuring tannins, which are a second 
dairy compound that are in leaves that leaches into the water and can be toxic to aquatic organisms. So Dr. Clay kind of covered this already, but students in my lab also present. Um, these are pictures of two different students presenting posters at ANS Day, but sometimes students from my lab will present at larger meetings as well. And then all the students in bold on these different publications were undergraduates and contributed to different publications in my lab. Not everybody does that. It's up to how interested in research and how much you want to be able um, to do that. If you want to go to graduate school, something like that. Um, we have lots of other people that put in, um, just want to learn a skill um, or learn some other aspects um, about the research. So. Um, as I said, people have different levels of commitment. People can come kind of learn about how to do water quality, if that's something you're interested in. Um, and then I have some students that conduct their own independent research projects. And with this, we'll be doing field work. We'll be doing this fall a lot of identifying trees and collecting leaves, and then taking those leaves back to the lab and cleaning and drying them and weighing them so that we can set up some of these experiments um, but later, there'll also be um, water samples to process and aquatic insects to identify. So if any of that sounds interesting, or if you just want to talk to me about any of this research, uh, please shoot me an email or come see me in Carson Taylor Hall. And next up is Dr. Kill. It's all the ecologists up here. Okay, which one is it? <laughs> no, they're both up here. This one? Okay. <laughs> they both got set up here next to each other. No, I don't know which one to use. And everybody, hello, I'm Dr. Hill. I think I'm the last of my last of the ecology people, maybe. I think so. So uh, my lab is also the ecology lab, but we work uh, from tributaries to estuaries, which means that we work on a combination of both freshwater and marine systems in my lab. So a little bit about my lab is that generally, I'm a behavioral ecologist and a community ecologist. So as a behavioral ecologist, I like to ask questions about uh, how organisms interact with one another and behavioral adaptations that they might have to their environment that help improve how they work, work around uh, their environment and the other species that they uh, live with. I'm also a community ecologist, so I just generally study the interactions of different species. Um, but primarily what you'll find in my lab is that we work on pretty much, you know, a couple of different things. Predator-prey interaction. So I like to know, like, how do prey smell predators and then run from them so they don't get eaten? Um, we work on human impacts to the aquatic environment. So we do this with either pollutants. We also look at how invasive species might impact uh, other species that are around, or if that invasive predator is a, if that invasive species is a predator, how that's going to affect the prey that are in the system, or if that invasive species is a plant, how is that going to affect the organisms that are able to colonize a community? So pretty much a lot of questions that sort of focus around like how we humans are changing the environment or predator-prey interactions is pretty much my bread and butter uh, and we do that in, a, in mostly marine and estuarine systems, but we also do a little bit of that in freshwater systems. So uh, if you look at sort of the, my research past, you'll see that there's a, like, a lot of jumping around from oysteries to seagrasses, to birds, to pollinators. I kind of jump all around all the place, but it's usually sort of somewhere in this predator-prey interaction, human impacts thing. So current projects that are going on in my lab, I have some funded research to look at how pesticides are impacting animal behavior and predator-prey interactions in aquatic environments. So the last couple of years, we've been doing this with um, in marine systems with our, uh, our friend, the blue crab, uh, which eats this guy, the periwinkle snail. Periwinkle snails are important grazers and fungal farmers on marsh grasses. And of course, marsh grasses is something in marshland is something we are losing uh, heavily in Louisiana. So we wanted to know are pesticides potentially influencing the predator prey interactions that are going on and influencing how productive our marshes are. So we've been exposing blue crabs to pesticides, periwinkles to pesticides, and then we put all three of these into big tanks in the lab and measured predation. 
We measured how far periwinkles migrate away from crabs and whether the pesticides affect these interactions in total in this community. So we've sort of wrapped up this aspect of our experiment, although I have one student who's still analyzing lots of behavioral videos from, from these experiments. And we've moved on to a freshwater comparison uh, in the same system. So looking at our friend, the crayfish. Um, so this is the one that you actually eat. This is Procamerus clarki. Um, this is an important commercial species in Louisiana, but is also an invasive species in a variety of places throughout the US and the world. Uh, and we're looking at how pesticides affect its ability to consume uh, this cool little snail. It's called a physid snail. And we're also looking at how pesticides affect the ability of physid snails to consume uh, periphyton, which is the algae. Basically, if you've seen algae scuzz growing over the top of a tank or growing on the tank walls, that's periphyton. So physid snails eat periphyton. They also usually like run out of the water when you expose them to crayfish cues. So in my lab, we've been asking how do pesticides affect crayfish and their ability to eat these guys, how pesticides affect these guys' ability to run from these guys, and how much it affects their ability to eat uh, this periphyton in the system. Uh, so currently in this fall, uh, my grad student Megan Burns is working on uh, the last experiment, which is how these physid snails are responding to pesticides. Um, and the spring, is when we're going to put this whole thing together. We're going to have a whole bunch of really big tanks outside. We're going to put crayfish and snails and plants and algae all together. And we're going to put pesticides in some of them and not in the others. And we're going to measure how all of this works out. So the idea is the question of if we do these single species experiments, does it actually translate to when we put all the stuff into a community or not? Other experiments going on in my lab is looking at invasive water hyacinth. I'm like, whoa, we switch from predator-prey interactions to invasive species. I told you, we kind of jump around in my lab, but we do lots of really cool stuff. Uh, so what we're doing in, with this invasive water hyacinth is determining how uh, it is impacted in low and moderate salinity estuary. So water hyacinth is this cool floating plant. Um, it is also an invasive species. And it's really nasty because it forms these really big mats uh, into in freshwater waterways. And so it's really hard to migrate your boat through that. You can imagine if you're a fish, you're gonna be like, whoa, this is a tangle of roots and mess. Like how am I supposed to navigate this waterway? Both as a human or as an organism. And so, but this, this water hyacinth is typically a freshwater plant, but when we have storms or flooding events, pieces of these mats or large chunks of these mats break off and float down the river where they end up in estuaries. And in Louisiana, we have weird estuaries. So a lot of our estuaries are actually low to moderate salinities, which means that uh, the salinities that they're at, this water hyacinth can actually survive. Where in tip a lot of more typical salinities, that water hyacinth, as soon as it hits salt water, it's gonna shrivel up and die because it does not like to be in salt water. But Louisiana, because we have so much freshwater input into our estuaries, this hyacinth can stick around for longer. And so it kind of creates the question of, well, what is it doing there? Like, is anything using it once it gets there? And if things are using it, is that, is that maybe beneficial? So I had some interns a couple of summers ago, pre-COVID, that looked at some uh, water hyacinth mats that washed into the estuary uh, down on the coast. And they found that killifish and shrimp and blue crabs love these mats uh, and love to occupy and are, are highly uh, abundant underneath these mats of water hyacinth, which is kind of cool. Um, and so now we have sort of more questions like, okay, well, this looks like it might be important. So how long are these going to stick around? How might, you know, pulses of freshwater or saltwater influence how long this hyacinth sticks around? So that's sort of some of the questions we have now that we know that water hyacinth actually might be really important in these estuaries. So right now in my lab, I have one graduate student, Megan Burns, uh, over here. Uh, I also have three undergraduate students, Annabeth Rawls, Adam Gonzalez, and Vance Melmoth. And you can see they're all working. This is the crayfish experiment we did last spring. So this is a lot of lab work in my lab. So we put these crayfish in the individual buckets and then we expose them to pesticides and we measured all these different things. So we do a lot of lab work. Uh, Annabeth has been primarily doing a lot of video analysis on previous blue crab experiments exposed to pesticides there. So what are we gonna be doing in the next couple of months? Well, as I told you in the fall, we're gonna be doing these experiments looking at how pesticides affect freshwater snails. Uh, Adam Gonzalez, my undergraduate in my lab is also gonna be doing an internship project where he's gonna be 
looking at how pulses of salinity affect hyacinth. So we're gonna basically put some hyacinth and some kidney pools out back and uh, measure plant growth and responses to that. And in the spring, uh, we're gonna be doing this big mesocosm experiment, um, looking at how pesticides affect predator prey interactions when we put those crayfish snails and plants all together in these big tanks. Uh, and so in the spring, the, you could do work on that with research credit, and there's also some paid positions in that as well. And then as pointed out by the previous faculty members, uh, undergraduates in my lab present and publish. Uh, so here's Annabeth Rawls presenting, this is her, uh, one of her, her presenting her award for ANS Day. She also presented at the Louisiana American Fisheries Society meeting. Um, we sort of have a streak going on for awards in my lab. I'm just saying in terms of presentations, <laughs> I challenge thee. <laughs> and uh, I've also got several undergraduates on paper. So the original hyacinth work that was done by two interns, we just published that in Journal of Experimental Marine Biology and Ecology. And uh, my former undergraduate, Eliza Barnes, uh, we have her, pay we just sent in our revisions on her project and I'm hoping we'll get good news back here in a couple of weeks that says that she is officially published as well. And lastly, I wanna plug for the LumCon Law Tech Internship Program. Anybody heard of this program? A couple of people. So this program is an internship program where you can actually go and participate in lab and field work down on the coast because, you know, we're six or seven hours away from the coast kind of hard to like get fully immersed in the marine experience. Um, and so students in this program, you have to apply to this program, but students go down and spend three weeks on the coast in late August, uh, working under a faculty member down there. And then you come back into, up here in the fall and you finish up your data analysis and creating a research poster to present um, under a faculty member up here. Um, so applications for this program go out in the late winter to early spring. Uh, this last summer's program has been on hiatus thanks to COVID and Hurricane Ida that kind of dual, dual nicks that idea. Uh, but uh, we will be having this program next year. And so um, it's open to biology, environmental science and wildlife and forestry majors. Next person is Dr. Mills, but I don't think he's here. So we're gonna click through his stuff. Lots of 3D printing. <laughs> um, look at it fast. <laughs> so it looks cool. Talk to him about it. <laughs> oh, a video. Sorry, I had to see it. <laughs> and another one. All right, it looks fun and interesting. So, uh, Dr. Schultz, you're, you're up. <laughs> uh -huh. So what class is this anyway? <laughs> Just out. what class is this? What is it? Bisque what? Or is this just seminar series and we've got kind of several different courses that come in and students that are interested? Yeah. Okay, outstanding. How many of you have taken my genetics class? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's gonna be pretty much the same thing here. So uh, my colleagues have been doing their projects for quite a while longer. And you might notice a slight difference in the slide quality. Um, yeah, I got an email from the Louisiana Biomedical Research Network, something in like April or May. Hey, you know that thing you applied for a year and a half ago? It's approved. And the topic of it, or the subject, is um, the identification of lethal alleles in humans. <clears throat> so, what does it mean? Well, it means I talked to it for way too long. And I kept seeing this thing, let's see, later, yeah. this, I think 50 times in a row at this point, 50 classes that I've taught. 
And one of those classes, I looked at it, and then I looked at it, and I said to myself, hey, wait, I think I can figure that out. Now, here's the real problem, is that this, in order to find this out, well, you'd need to have some sort of a mapping population or a cross with sufficient numbers of offspring for each allele you're looking at. Um, any couples in here wanna, wanna volunteer? No? Yeah, it's kind of, kind of unethical, right? Can't really do that with humans. Yikes, right? Because we're looking for this. We're looking for the lack of this homozygous recessive individual. That's the definition of a lethal allele. That's the definition I had when I was in school. It's the definition you have now. It's the definition I think Dr. Campbell had when he was in school, if he remembers that part of that. <laughs> He's not that much older than I am, so. All right, so let's get a, do a little background. Basically, they are the lack of a living uh, homozygous recessive offspring. Actually do this. Um, they're described, they're also described as ones in which the lifespan of an individual is severely impacted or that they don't get to the point of reproduction, okay? Um, for instance, cystic fibrosis had been a lethal disease up until the last 20 years or so. You usually didn't live past your teens with cystic fibrosis. Now you do, okay? So it's quite frankly, since you can reproduce and you can have cystic fibrosis, it's not a lethal allele anymore, not a lethal gene. I foolishly, when I sent this project in, defined lethal as causing an involuntary biological termination during the full period from fertilization through parturition or birth. Oops. Turns out that in most of the literature, they just say from birth until, you know, you don't give, you, you're not able to reproduce. You pass away before that. That's a way easier thing to measure, apparently, than, okay, did you get pregnant? And from that pregnancy, did you give birth? Hmm. Okay, how, how do we measure that? Oh, crap. Because what this ends up being is, here's my target here. And in order to find out those, those answers, the things that affect the lack of birth, the whole rest of this wall is filled with things we're gonna to have to look at to identify what causes failure of parturition. Okay, and I have a list coming up, don't worry. Um, yikes, that's a pretty big, pretty big thing to, to bite off. All right, so, why do we care? We already have an overpopulation problem, right? Yeah, we do right now. But knowing what allows you to improve your birth rate, that's not a bad thing to know. To so stick in your back pocket and say, you know, let's keep that just in case. Just in case we want to figure out why our birth rate is declining if it's not a societal issue. So we're only gonna look at genes that are uh, translated into polypeptides. We're not gonna look at mRNA molecules or RNAs as they may affect um, whether or not you're able to, to give birth. Now, there are a whole bunch of different estimates of genes, but I'm gonna use the one uh, from 2018 that says there's 19,992 of them. <sighs> a bioinformatics background. That's 19,992. Most of my bioinformatics background, there is a B after the number I'm looking for, right? I can program something to look at the entire human genome, no problem. That's not this project. This project's a little more up close and personal. 
And it's going to require a very, very, very specific group of people looking at very specific things over and over and over and over again. Okay. Um, what are they going to look at? So I said there was going to be a list. There is. So the most useful one is on the bottom here, right? Right down here. If that particular gene is associated with an autosomal recessive disorder or disease, I'm not interested in it, right? It's not lethal. You're born. Congratulations. Guess what? I've now got 19,991 genes to go, right? I'm an optimist, right? So this is a matter of kind of like a samurai and a rotten stump. You're cutting off all the good stuff off of that stump of wood out in your backyard so that the only thing you have left are the rotten ones, okay? So slowly but surely, we're gonna work through and ask these questions. Hey, is the gene we're looking at associated with control of cellular replication? If it is, we're still interested, right? So lethality rating, if that gets mutated, oh yeah, we wanna look at that, you bet. And it kind of goes down from there as to how much interest we have for each one of these. Now, there's a couple of things I wanna bring up. My esteemed colleagues, have projects that may not have sounded as interesting to you as some other things you may be able to do. But I can tell you after being in science for 25 years and being an omnivore, keep your ears open and your eyes open. If something in there sounded interesting, do it. And I'm gonna tell you something else too. You never know where you're gonna get an inspiration because one of those presentations that I just watched, I added, something else to this list. I'm not gonna say who's, and I'm not gonna say what, but I've got something else on that list now. Easy money. Huh. All right, I'm gonna say a couple more things. I started out by volunteering at Washington State in, an, in a lab. I didn't get paid for an entire semester, 15 weeks. At the end of that 15 weeks, they fired the English person, the English student, the literally English, English major who was in their lab and said, hey, we're going to pay you basically 20 hours a week to work. And I've never worked in anything but science since. That's 25 years. Okay? You never know when an opportunity is going to happen. And volunteering is a great idea. In terms of references, I'm not going to tell you why, but I can tell you in the last nine years, why I have this number, I hadn't kept track of it until last week. Bill Campbell knows why. 223 letters of recommendation. That's how many I've written. I'm sure if we added up the other faculty members here that have similar numbers. We're here to help you on your way. And that's one of the big parts that we can do. Don't be afraid to ask, okay? Now, there are some projects that I've got up here. Don't worry about that. By the time next quarter or the quarter after comes around, I'll probably have 20 or 30 in unique projects you can do as a 360. Um, how many of you actually took my genetics in person? Okay. Do you ever wonder what the names were on the wall in the lab? Those are 360 students from before. Finish a 360 project, your name goes on a brick. And they've also, every single person on that wall, let a recommendation. And as well, just so you realize I'm not just kind of making stuff up. I've published 27 peer reviewed publications. I know how to publish. It's been a while, um, things have happened, but I'm looking forward to getting back into this and having some fun. Are there any questions? All right, um, either you've taken my class and you know how to get a hold of me, 
well, you know someone who has taken my class and they know how to get a hold of me. Um, let me know if you're interested in doing a 360 in the winter or spring, but I'd love to have you. I think that's it. That's everybody. Um, do we have any any questions for anybody that spoke? There's a chat here. Oh, oh, it's Warren to me. Okay. Oh, it wasn't a question. Just oh. Oh, talking about the Nazca boobies. Oh, killing each other. Okay, yeah, I can respond. I can respond to him. Okay, I can respond to him. Thanks for the question, Warren. All right. Um, well, that's, why is it not going? <laughs> that's it. Um, oh. Oh, when would be a good time to apply? Oh, you can reach out at any time, right? So, um, you know, it's in the middle of the quarter. So if you want to do something for credit, you know, it's you can't do it for credit this quarter, but you can certainly start volunteering and then um, you're set up to get credit next quarter, right? So there's never a bad time to inquire. Yes. I just wanted to add that uh, Dr. Green has mentioned about the two courses, uh, Biological Sciences 240, that is a one credit course, and then 360 is variable credit. You can take it for one, two, or three credits, depending on how much time you spend in the lab. Those two courses are offered every quarter, which is summer. But you have to have contact, contact with a faculty member ahead of time. You can't just go on and sign up and apply. So yeah. That's something you would work with with a faculty member you were interested in. You are interested in those topics. Yeah. Yes. My name, uh, Campbell, is, my name is listed as instructor for those, for those courses, but I don't do any of that. That's just administrative. It's up for play, so uh, you need to make arrangements directly with the faculty you want to work with. Yeah. Okay. I'm just going to repeat what y'all said so the folks online can hear. Um, so uh, Dr. Campbell just mentioned that the courses that you can take, take which are BISC 240 and 360, BISC 240, you can only take for one uh, credit hour at a time. BISC 360, you can take for one, two, or three hours of credit um, in a particular quarter, depending on how much time you spend on your project. And Dr. Clay mentioned that you can't just sign up for the course. Um, on BOSS, you have to have worked out with a professor what you're going to do before you can actually enroll in that course. Do you guys have any other questions, burning desires you want to ask about research or any of this? All right. Thanks to all the faculty that spoke. <laughs>